Welcome to Technically. So, ladies and gentlemen, and all variations thereupon, welcome to this May 2021 edition of Technically. For those new to our series, I'm your host, Michael Beck, the Director of Operations at Tenon. Uh, before we get to today's guest, I do have a quick announcement. On Monday, May 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern uh, U.S. time, we'll be launching our new German-speaking edition of Technically, uh, hosted by Yoshi Koppel. Um, and the first guest will be Eric Eggert, who is a professor emeritus of uh, technically, so to speak, of at least of the English speaking version. Um, so if you are a German speaker, keep an eye on uh, our Twitter account at Twitter API. I'm sorry, at Tenon API for uh, registration info. Um, the German technically will be a monthly series that will be on the third Monday of every month. Um, and with that out of the way, let me welcome today's guest, Martin Underhill. Welcome, Martin. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for being with us. Uh, today, Martin will be talking about the section element and answering the burning questions such as what on earth is a section element? Um, how do we use it properly? In what ways is the section element different from other elements like the article or the main element? Um, if you've ever asked yourself this or any questions like it, Today's your day because Martin is here to explain it all. Um, and as always, if you have any questions for Martin, please put them in the chat and we'll answer them after the presentation. And if there's any time after that, we'll open the floor up to any accessibility related questions for our little brain trust that we have here right now. Um, and so without any further ado, the floor is all yours, Martin. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for having me again, Michael. It's great to be, to be on and, and uh, good to see everybody uh, on the call. Um, I'm, uh, let me just jump quickly to my notes. There we go. So uh, I'm Martin Underhill. Um, I'm a principal experience designer at Sage, uh, which is a, a quite a large um, company that does accounting software of all, of all kinds. Um, as well as being a designer, uh, I'm a bit of a front-end developer. Um, got a strong background in in things like HTML and CSS and and then avoidance and, and and other things like JavaScript wherever I can. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm that. Uh, I've got a background in uh, UK government's um, digital side of things, uh, the GDS um, principles and all that kind of stuff. I, I worked for for a few years doing that. So, uh, and all of the um, and all of the prioritization they put on uh, accessibility with um, government services being something that everybody has to use. So making sure that everyone is included. So that brought me into my current role where I'm an accessibility specialist. Um, but I guess above and beyond all of that, uh, I'm a dad uh, of two children and um, I'm husband to, to Bea. Um, so, uh, that's me in a, in a very quick nutshell. Let me dive straight in. So, um, oh, I should also mention at this stage, uh, I don't speak the Queen's English necessarily. So if anybody struggles with uh, my accent, please pipe up, let me know, and I'll either rephrase uh, the, 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 the language I'm using uh, or I'll try and slow down a little bit. Um, it's, it's easy to to, to take, the, take the boy out of Glasgow, but not necessarily to take the Glasgow out of the boy, if that makes sense. So um, HTML5 and cowpaths is where I'd like to start. So the idea of, of, uh, of HTML5 was that it, where it took over from, or when it superseded uh, XHTML was that it would be paving the cowpath. That, that was one of the design principles behind it. So in 2019-ish, Ish. Uh, HTML5 was starting to get a bit of traction and seeing some adoption. Um, and the idea was to design it around what people were already doing. So there were things like uh, I, I think there was the, the the bots were sent out across the across the, the World Wide Web, and uh, they they found that, that there was lots of commonalities across all these websites. So people were using things like a div with a class of header. So from that, they inferred that, okay, header is something that's quite useful. So why don't we make a, a header element in HTML? So that was just one example of many, um, but that's only part of the story. So that's paving the cowpaths. Um, 
but there are also some new paths that were forged. Um, HTML5 changed and repurposed some semantics, um, the, the I element and the B element being, being a couple of kind of prominent um, ones of those, um, which I'll not, I could, I could digress, but I won't. Um, it also introduced some new, uh, new semantics like the header element that I mentioned, uh, the footer was one, um, main was a bit of a latecomer, but that was, that was another one that arrived. Um, the main thing was for me though that, that it raised lots of questions. Um, it wasn't like for like anymore. There was lots of new things to learn. So one of my questions was, what on earth is the section element even for? Uh, and this was, a, it may not be a direct quote, but it was, this was some something around the, the sort of, the, the sort of question I would have been asking around 2009 uh, when I started to, to, to use HTML5. So let's start by talking about landmarks. Landmarks um, are things that a sighted user can identify on a page. So you have a header, you have a navigation, you have maybe a main content area, you have a sidebar and a footer. So that's, this is a, a diagram here, a very, very rough wireframe of all those things. Very sort of classic website at, um, in the desktop uh, mode. Um, here I've numbered those elements. So number one is the header right at the top there. Number two is the navigation, which is inside the header and kind of maybe off to the right hand side. Again, we're looking at this on a kind of a laptop view rather than a mobile view. Uh, and we're concentrating on, on, the, uh, on the visual aspect of it as well at this stage. Uh, number three, we've got the main content area. Number four, you've got a bit of a sidebar. And then number five, you've got a footer down the bottom there. Those are things that, that they found to be common across almost every website uh, across the web. But uh, just as a sighted user can visually identify those landmarks, screen reader users have superpowers as well. So what they can do is they can quickly bring up a list of all the landmarks on the page and then jump to any one of them uh, that they choose in the same way that, that a sighted user can visually identify these things and then zo zo zoom in or zoom in, zone in on that, that one that they're interested in. So, okay, I'm interested in the footer because I came here to find your Twitter account. Probably it's in the footer. So as a sighted user, I scroll down, find the footer. Okay, there's the Twitter link. As a non-sighted user, I can find that landmark, that, that footer landmark and, and jump straight to it and have a look around, have a poke around for the, the Twitter link. So um, this is where things get interesting. So those new elements that we were given uh, in HTML5 came with implicit roles. And the idea here is that um, screen readers can take one of these elements and then give it a role um, to communicate to a screen reader user. So the, the screen reader does that. It kind of goes across the page, picks out the role, finds a header. Okay, this is a header. So it communicates that to the user in order for them to, to have a look through the, 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 the diff different elements on the page. Um, and these common landmarks, um, because it's implicit, we don't have to say anything. We don't have to add any attributes like role equals banner or something like that to our, our header anymore. Just It's just implicitly uh, added there. So here's a, here's a very rough look at what the uh, markup for that uh, example page might look like. We've got the body element uh, containing everything there. And then it's, it's very bare bones. So at the top, we've got a header. And inside the header, um, just like the diagram, we've got the navigation. After the header, we've got a main element, which, which is, uh, contains all of our, our main content. Then we've got the aside element, which is used for the sidebar. Um, and then at the bottom, the footer. So that, that structure there would be what we would use to create the, the page um, that I've shown you before. So with those, we get the, these lovely implicit rules here. We get uh, the header becomes a banner. The navigation is in a navigation. Uh, the main is a main, uh, the complement, uh, the, the aside uh, or the sidebar is complementary, and then the footer is what's known as content info. So telling you about the contents uh, of the page. 
Um, these rules uh, allow screen reader users to, to identify those landmarks in the same way that, that a sighted user could. But there's more. So custom landmarks become a thing. So um, this is where the section element comes in. So some visually identifiable landmarks that aren't included in HTML, um, I guess it could be it could it could be anything really. But if you scan around a page and you can you can lock on to something and say, okay, I know what that is. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a look at that thing. Uh, some of those things might be uh, headers, footers, but they might be more nuanced things like uh, perhaps blog post information. Um, it might appear on the side of the page where the where the sidebar would be, but it's not strictly speaking in a side, which I'll, I'll get to. Um, but yeah, blog post information, that kind of thing. You can have a filter panel, that would be what you could use a section for as well. Um, just, you know, something like on an e-commerce site where you can where you can refine your search. If you've looked for something, you can say, I want, only want to see the blue versions of this or the or the, the red versions and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, filter panels uh, could, could be a landmark. Um, and then calls to action are probably a good one as well. So on marketing websites, you might have the call to action down at the bottom there. That would be something that you'd be able to easily visually identify. Um, and in the same way that you'd want to give that same uh, power to to non-visual users um, and give this give them that uh, that call to action a, a role um, using um, section. But um, a section is essentially a div um, from a semantic perspective, and that's me quoting myself there. So uh, this was an article that I wrote a couple of months ago that. Uh, that kind of sparked this whole discussion off. Um, the uh, screen reader doesn't know anything about a section. Um, so we need to tell the browser what each section actually is before we can before we can do anything with it. And what we do there is we give a section meaning by using aria to label them. So we can either use aria label or we can use aria labeled by. And I'll take you through each uh, of those and the, the sort of pros and cons uh, of each. So if we were to use ARIA label, uh, here's an example where we've got a section element uh, with an ARIA label attribute on the section uh, opening tag, uh, and it says join the mailing list. The section has a header, a heading, sorry, um, which is an H2, uh, join the mailing list. So those two things are exactly the same. And uh, I'm using an example from VoiceOver on macOS. Uh, it says, join the mailing list region. So that's all pretty straightforward. A screen reader user would understand that they're in a joining, uh, there is a join the mailing list region, and then they can jump straight to that. Then they get the header, which, which reinforces where they are. And then they can read the, the details about joining the, the mailing list, uh, maybe, maybe sign up at that point. Uh, and a call to action is quite a, a sort of nice, simple example of, of, of this. But the problem is that it's a bit re repetitive. We're adding the same content in two places. Uh, we may be using a templating language, um, something like Nunjux or, or Twig or something, but, but where we can output the same piece of data in two places. But still, there's a bit of duplication there that we could probably do with avoiding. So the problem is if the headings change, there's a risk that the ARIA label value is forgotten about and doesn't change as well. So you might end up in a situation like this, um, where you've changed your heading, but you haven't changed your ARIA label. So in this example, we've got the same, the same code. Uh, the ARIA label still says join the mailing list, but we've updated the subscribe to, uh, the heading to subscribe to our mailing list. Um, now, first, well, I guess first of all, the marketing department might not be very happy that you've done that. Um, that they've put all that work into, into that brilliant new copy that's going to get all those new subscribers, uh, and then your your uh, giving screen reader users the old experience. Um, so they're not going to be very happy with that. There's also the issue that you've got a mismatch between the landmarks label and the heading. So that can be a bit disorienting for some users. Um, a screen reader user would expect to see um, a section uh, and that would be reinforced by its heading or its main heading. So here we get the same uh, landmark uh, in VoiceOver, in our, if, we look, if we were to look in our, in our kind of elements or our rotor um, uh, view, it would say join the mailing list region rather than subscribe to our mailing list. So a better way to do it is to use ARIA labeled by. This takes out all of the, the repetition uh, that we have. So we've got the section that has an ARIA labeled by attribute on the opening tag this time. Um, and that 
are you labeled by value matches the ID that we've added to our H2. So the H2 says join the mailing list. Uh, and if we reference that, that means that whatever we, we ever, whatever we update the, the heading to, um, it'll always be reflected in the section. So there's zero risk of any mismatches or, uh, or any of the, the marketing department coming after you. So that would say join the mailing list region in this example. And if we were to update to subscribe to our mailing list, it would then say subscribe to our mailing list region um, in, in voiceover. So you've got that area labeled by uh, hooking itself up to the, the H2 or whatever value that is. That's exactly what it'll tell you that, that region is. With that, there's no repetition. The section refers to the heading for its accessible name and uh, the heading has changed. Um, uh, if the heading has changed, the section just uses the new heading content. And again, I'm referring to myself, I'm quoting myself, uh, the section is a custom, a, a section is a custom landmark. Give it some semantic meaning with ARIA and screen reader users will be able to jump right to it, just like a sighted person, a sighted user can. Right, so I'll, I'll talk now a little bit about some other powers. I've talked about the, the, uh, the landmarking superpowers that you give people with, uh, with using the, by using the section element correctly. Um, but you've also got sectioning uh, in, its, in and of itself. So what you can do is you can section headers and footers. So I'll explain a little bit more about that. Some, some uh, landmarks are uh, unique. So you're only allowed one banner. You're only allowed one main. You're only allowed one content info. You can have several of other landmarks, like you can have several adverts. So you might have several um, complementary landmarks. But these three element, uh, these three landmark rules here, you're only allowed one of each. But uh, I don't I mean that makes sense visually because you're you're looking at a website, you want to only know, you, there's one header, that, that's that's kind of the way these things work. You've got one bit of main content, one one uh, footer. Um, that, that makes perfect sense. But then there's a bit of a clash um, in that um, we are actually allowed to use more than one header or footer. So where does that leave us? So I've, I've, I've had a look in this HTML5 doctor website here where it says you can use multiple headers. Uh, you can use multiple headers, uh, each of which uh, will then become a header for that section of the document. So this is also true of footers, um, but what's going on here? Um, well, and also, I mean, what, what does that have to do with the section element? Well, section elements are unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly sectioning elements. Um, sectioning content uh, from the HTML living standard. Sectioning content is content that defines the scope of headings and footers. And there are four sectioning elements, um, one of which is section. We also have article, aside, and nav. Those three, uh, those four um, elements are what's known as sectioning elements. So if you have a header or a footer inside there, it removes the implicit rule. So if you have those nested headers and footers, then they don't, they're not exposed as banners and content info um, uh, rules or landmarks. So what we've done there is we've made sure that we don't give our users multiple headers, multiple footers, um, as far as the landmarks are concerned, but we are able to use header and footer semantically inside uh, discrete sections. Um, whether that's an actual section, ele section element or one of the other three there. So yes, so what we're doing is we're scoping header and footer elements. Um, a section can have its own header and footer and these are not page header or footer. And this is an example. So if we go back to our, uh, our amazing website that we've, that we've wireframed and we've put the, the basic HTML together for, um, this is the, the bottom section, which was where we look at the packages. And we've got uh, a bunch of packages. And this is pretty typical uh, on websites. You might have three tiers. You might have basic, standard, or and pro, or something like that. You've got the three, three different versions, and they all cost different amounts and that kind of thing. So on this website, what we've done is we, we're offering a, a pro package, and that's our most popular package. So we've got a section. And inside that section, at the top, we've got a header. And at the bottom, we've got a footer. And in between that, we've got a heading. Uh, say in the pro package and we've got a list of all the amazing uh, things you get when you buy that pro package. 
Um, in the header, we've got an image, um, which is what makes it its header. So it might be, maybe it's bronze, silver, gold. We want to use that kind of metaphor. Um, this one here would maybe have the silver or the gold um, badge, like a, or a little trophy or something like that. Um, some kind of identifiable marker um, that you, you, you can put in, inside a header. And then the footer, you've got the terms and conditions. Uh, and that might have a link out to, to a page with some terms and terms and conditions on it. So that's how you would use a header and a footer in a in a section as opposed to being part of the main page. So now that we've talked about sectioning, we can talk a little bit more about outlining or talk about outlining for the, for the first time. So um, this is a bit more of a historical study uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, there was a thing when HTML 5.0 uh, came out um, back, I think it was released in 2008. So when that was finally finished, they had this idea, a great idea of the, uh, the HTML5 document outline. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with a spoiler alert. It has been deprecated. Uh, HTML5.1 um, kind of got rid of it. Um, it was tried, it didn't, it didn't uh, take hold, but uh, yeah, so it's deprecated. So don't use it. Um, what it did though, it was interesting because it allowed sections to be moved, moved around um, without you having to worry about the markup. So you wouldn't have to change a heading level two to a heading level three if you were to nest it deeper or you wouldn't have, or vice versa, or you wouldn't have to worry about anything basically. It would all take care of itself because it would be all, all be scoped to that section. And it's a great idea for modular content. Uh, and if you've got say like a, a CMS that, that kind of works in that kind of, um, yeah, in that kind of way uh, where everything has its own place and, and you're and you're kind of then pulling those things out and putting them in your own order on the on the home page or whatever it might be then it was a, it was a, it was a good idea um and it allowed you to mix and match it with the h1 to h6 um markup so you you weren't locked you didn't have to have an h1 for everything which is what i'll show you in the next example uh you could use h6s or or h2s and h3s or you could um have a one page that has the, the, the HTML5 document outline and then another page uh, that might be written uh, with, with H1 to H6 in kind of more classic fashion, uh, which is probably more for things like blog posts and things that you might want to mark, uh, use Markdown to write. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the kind of mix and match difference, but very useful in certain circumstances. So this is the, this is the code that it might be uh, built with. Um, going back to our, our uh, wireframe earlier, we've got the, uh, the main element, which has got everything inside of it. And inside that main element, we've got uh, a heading level one, which is uh, the name of the company, example, limited web services. And then you've got three sections. Uh, first section is for services. The second section is for testimonials. And the third is for uh, our amazing packages. And we've seen an example of what that markup inside those packages might look like um, in the last uh, part of the talk. Um, set, uh, services there, we can see we've got two uh, nested sections, one for web design and one for web development. And uh, basically what, what this very simple, simplified to its outline example does is it demonstrates how everything is an H1 and we're using section elements to, um, to scope uh, the level of the heading. So the ones that are surrounded by two a parent and a grandparent section element, those ones are heading level three because they're three levels deep. Uh, the ones that have one um, section as a parent are, are H2s effectively. Um, and this is sort of how that would look as an outline. So you've got the example web limited, uh, example limited web services, and then you've got the three sections and then inside, inside services, you've got those two um, bullet points nested in there for web design and web development. So as I said, unfortunately, the HTML 5.1 specification requires developers to use H1 to H6, H6 to convey document structure. The HTML5 document outline is not implemented. So that was from an article, I think again, it was on uh, HTML5 doctor, um, computer says no to HTML5 document outline. So that there, um, I mean, that, that was it basically. It was a, it was a, it was a shame, uh, but, you know, these things, these things are the way they are. Um, browsers even style your nested um, headings properly when they're scoped with, with, the, uh, with the section element. Um, you give it, give it a shot. It's quite, quite interesting to see how, how far it got down the line. 
Google have confirmed that it's cool with the outline algorithm that you're not going to be competing for H1s so long as it's all scoped in, in sections um, from an SEO point of view. Um, but it was never fully adopted by user agents um, and assistive technology just reads H1, 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 heading level one. So it, it doesn't it doesn't make any any it doesn't discern between the H1 and the and the nested two levels H1, which should be an H3. So we're stuck with H1 to H6 for everything. Um, but the good thing here is uh, that it's nicely backwardly compatible. So in our example here, we've just got exactly the same structure there, an H1, uh, three H2s, and, and after the first H2, the two H3s with the uh, services, testimonials, and, and the packages, and then got those nested web design and web development services in there as well. Um, I'm, in a way, I'm, I'm kind of glad. I think the the HTML5 document outline wasn't really a it wasn't really progressively enhanceable or or a progressive progressive enhancement. So it doesn't really feel all that HTML-y to me because um, the idea of HTML is that it's always going to be backwardly compatible. But what we were doing here is we were breaking things um, for users that might be using um, well screen readers. Uh, users for, to the great extent, and also um, older users that use older browsers as well. So I think the, 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 the final thing to take you through is the, the similar elements. How does section differ from uh, certain other landmarks? Um, I mean, header, navigation, or nav, uh, footer, they're all pretty obvious in their uses. You know, they're quite, it's quite, you know, those are what they are, basically. Um, but some elements aren't as distinct from section, so uh, we might might benefit from a, a bit of a deep dive into those. So the main element is the most recent uh, addition to the spec. Um, and this is the stuff that your title uh, is talking about. So the, the title being um, that kind of metadata that appears in your browser tab. Um, and is important for assistive technology and uh, and search engines alike. Basically, this title is this document is about this thing. This is the thing that you can drill right into. It's for the main content of the document. You're only allowed one um, on the page, um, and I mentioned uh, they are perceivable, so you can only have one displayed at one time, uh, whether that's visually or otherwise. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you have two main elements, one has to be hidden and the other has to be shown, then you can maybe toggle between the two. I mean, for, for me, I, I don't, don't see that being too, too much of a, of a use case, but it is allowed. Um, essentially, though, you're only allowed one. Um, it's probably the destination of your skip to content link. So in your, uh, you, you, might, you might be um, helpfully um, jumping past the, that big block of navigation at the top for keyboard users or screen reader users, so um, they can, they, they, they use their, in the tab index, they have this link which can jump them past that conveniently. And um, you're gonna to wanna to take them to the main element because that's the main part of the page. It's also the thing that's used by Safari for its reader mode. Um, and I know that, um, that Firefox and Edge, uh, and uh, probably Opera, I think there's there's a, a but not Chrome, um, for probably obvious reasons, but they, they um, reader mode is basically zooms you right in on that main content of the page and gets rid of all the distractions so that you, you can really focus. Um, it, it's also what read it later services like Instapaper, Pocket or uh, Safari's reading list um, use as the kind of main focus of the page. So they'll, they'll grab that and then save that in your, in your uh, reading list for another time. It's uh, main isn't a sectioning element. Um, so we can't nest another header or a footer in there. Um, it's worth mentioning just because it feels like it should be, but it's, it's not. So um, the next thing is, is an article. Um, the article element is a self-contained chunk of content and it's reusable elsewhere. Um, and by reusable elsewhere, it could be the same site. It might be that you've got a blog listing. Uh, doesn't have to be the whole article. Um, it can just be a little snippet teasing you, um, come and read this next article. Um, but it lives on a different page. So, so it can, it's that content that can be put anywhere on your website and it would make sense. You can also use it in an RSS feed, JSON feed, something like that. Um, if you're more, if you're, if you're, if you're a geek like me and you like to keep up with your RSS. 
Um, or you can have it on an entirely different website. The, the article is something that would make sense out of context. Um, and it might link back to your main full blog post, for example. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what the article's for. It doesn't of, doesn't have to be a blog post either. It could be could be something something else. But uh, yeah, something that makes sense out of context. Context. Um, you can have as many of those as you like. They could be nested one inside the other, uh, and that is a sectioning element. It's also worth mentioning that the, this is potentially the same thing as the main element. So what you might have is the main element wrapping uh, an article. Um, so, and I know the article does expose um, things, I think it does have an effect for things like if Apple Watch and things, if you if you wanted to um, read an article on your Apple Watch, it'll, it'll look for the article element. Um, if someone sends you a link, for example. Um, I mean, it's a very small article, very small uh, canvas to be reading on, but yeah, nonetheless. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, that's how the article element works. The aside element I mentioned earlier, that's um, it's for content that's not really related to the page. Um, so for adverts, uh, they might be related. You know, they might be they might be of a theme, but it's not what you're there for. It's not the content of the page. Uh, social media feeds might come into that. Um, they belong to well, belong to you. They they belong to Twitter or whoever. But the uh, you know the the they're, they're, they're your thing, but yeah, they, they're an aside. They're not part of what you're actually there for. Um, tangentially linked content of any type, really. Um, so they're, they're not for things like pull quotes or author info or content filters and sidebars and things like that. Uh, I have seen a few um, things that point toward them as being for pull quotes. Um, uh, the problem with that is that um, if they're a child, they should be a child of the body element, because if they're scoped to something like an article um, or a main, then they're not, then they don't get exposed to assistive technology. So non-sighted users can't ignore them in the same way that you could as a sighted user. So yeah, the sighted user might have that banner blindness, the idea, you know, they've got that top right hand corner, that's for the advert, I'm going to ignore that. Um, we want to give that exactly the same uh, power to uh, a non-sighted user so they can dodge the asides uh, and just concentrate on what they're actually there for. So that's that one. And finally, the uh, div element. The uh, This is something with absolutely no semantic meaning or power at all. You can't do anything fancy with it without adding ARIA rules and all that kind of thing, but but that's probably something that you that you want to avoid if, if possible, if, or certainly if there's a if there's a semantic HTML element which will do that job for you. Um, some questions to ask yourself. Um, do you need to expose the element as a landmark? And do you need sectioning powers? If not, it's a div. Uh, and that's and that's those are the those are the kind of similar elements. So just to sum up, um, a section is for creating landmarks uh, on a page um, for assistive technology. It's for sectioning header and footer elements, so you don't end up with multiple, which can be confusing, um, and and you'll you'll be breaking uh, you'll be breaking your automated tests with that, I'd imagine. It used to be for outlining, not anymore. Um, and then, as well, it's something different to main article aside and div. It has its own it has its own use. It's distinct from those. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's me. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. Do we have any questions from anyone? You can either throw it in the chat or I mean, you can, if you feel like it, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and throw that up. Oh, PJ has a question. Um, now that we don't have outline um, and we have the H1 to H6 giving us the uh, structure uh, one of the problems, I think, is um, is trying to prepare uh, things and, and have it in a content management system and then being able to pull it in with the correct, uh, you know, the correct header, the advantage of something like, I guess, a section or <laughs> too bad about the outline is that you could uh, create it with, you know, say an H2 and it would always be an H2, but you could pull it in, um, you know, like wherever it went, instead of having to worry about it falling into the structure of the document. It's more a comment than a question, I think. 
No, it's a, it's a good point. My my um, templates are often littered with context. So if this bit of content <laughs> appears in this particular position, then give it an H2. If not, use H1, um, H3. Yeah, it's, it gets a little bit messier, doesn't it? It's the, yeah, the burden is on the developer, I guess. Now it's a, yeah, not ideal, but. Well, especially if you have lots of people working on teams, um, it's really makes it difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was one of those things. It was a kind of a double edged sword when they when they, I remember being disappointed when it was when it was removed um, back in, I think, 2014. Um, but at the same time, I guess that whole the, that it's not a progressive enhancement it kind of felt like, okay, well, this is this is probably for the best because backward compatibility or um, we're not breaking things for 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 uh, certain users, but yeah. Difficult. All right. Um, Gonzalo Severio asks, is the approach you are outlining hold across assistive technology products and versions? And how about the technical ability and, and age of users? <laughs> Is this for the for the la, for the landmarking for the adding the role to the section to adding the area label to the section particularly? Um, yes. Yeah, it's pretty well supported um, as as far as I'm as far as my experience goes. Um, the yeah, I've tested it in 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 with lots of different combinations from. Um, yeah, VoiceOver and Safari on Mac, the same on um, iOS, um, then looking at things like NVDA and Firefox on, on Windows. And it, and, it, and it doesn't quite say exactly the same thing, but it does convey the, the meaning of the, of the section element. Um, different versions of, of the screen reader and, and browser software, I, I wouldn't want to comment too, too authoritatively on that uh, as, as time's gone by, but, but, but certainly things are looking good. The minute. All right. Um, Bruce Blazer asked to clarify: you do not need to make a section a landmark in order to use a header or footer in it. No, no. You you, you can. I mean, a section without um, without a, an aria label or an aria labeled by attribute is just a div, effectively. Um, Apart from the fact that it'll it'll do that sectioning thing with nested uh, footers and headers, it'll remove the the implicit rule from them. Uh, but effectively, it's a div, so you can use any heading you want inside there. Uh, I would use a heading um, just for just for the way that a document might be might be put together uh, and expected to be um, to be read. Um, but but yeah, if that answers your question. Okay, I'm sure Bruce will let us know if not. Uh, but in the meantime, Elizabeth Patrick asks, is a section the same as uh, Roll Eagles region? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, it just exposes something as a region, yeah. Okay, uh, Sarah Bourne had a comment that uh, our folks wanted the outline because they couldn't make it work in their content management system. It turns out the browsers couldn't either. Uh, it's probably still easier to get your CMS to do it, though. Yeah. It's interesting. Okay, anyone else have any questions? For Martin or for, for anybody here? Any any burning things that are going on at work that you don't get? Can't wrap your head around? Nope. Um. I have one more, um, which is uh, we just mentioned role equals region. Um, how is that to is, can that be used in conjunction with section or other? I mean, it, oh, it would be. I guess it would be implicit with the with the name. Uh, you could add role equals region, and it would expose it as a region. Um, but without a label, um, it's kind of meaningless. Um, you, you you'd want to give it some kind of meaning um, and you would just use the section element anyway so because things may change things you know so the rule equals region might have uh, or I might know some might I might not know something that the rule equals region would be I guess like a button if you've got a button and you give a div class of button you're also going to have to give it tab index equals zero and, and all those other things that you need to you need to do to expose it 
as a button properly. So you end up doing more work to to replicate the same thing. So I would I would always err towards using the HTML rather than the rule. Um, I guess it's a bit like a, a nav element. If you've got several nav elements on the page, which is fine, you're probably going to want to give each of those uh, a label, um, just so that um, in terms of looking at all the landmarks on the page, you can read through that list and, and know that you don't just have navigation, navigation, navigation. You've got primary navigation, uh, you've got app, app specific navigation, you might have global navigation. You, so you've got different labels for each of the navigations in the same way that you would label each of the sections. All righty. Well, I think we are done with our questions and that brings us to an end to this webisode of Technically. Thank you, Martin, for that presentation. Um, and thank you to our attendees, of course, for, for joining us. Uh, our next webisode will be on June 2nd at 11 a.m. Eastern and features Stockholm's own Daniel Goransson. Uh, he hasn't decided on a topic yet. He has three or four that he's bouncing around and he's trying to figure that out. But uh, keep an eye on uh, Twitter at 10 API for that info once he makes that decision. And uh, thank you again, Martin, and we will see you all next month.